Uh, th thanks everyone for for showing up. Uh, we, we will be talking about whiskey and, as Rebecca said, in particular capacity planning. I'll get to that in a bit. I'm Pradeek Singh. I'm director of business agility at uh, Ultimate Kronos Group, um, and also co-host of the Drunk Agile podcast. So, if if you don't get enough of whiskey in this one. Please, please, please watch our podcast or listen to it. It's Dan Vacanti and I hosting the Drunk Agile podcast. So the question we're going to answer today, how much whiskey will I drink over the next, say, 16 weeks or so, or the next four months? And in answering that question, really what we will be talking about is capacity planning. How much work can we actually commit to? Uh, usually when I work with teams, I see their capacity plans looking a lot more like that overloaded truck than something that's probably doable. Um, before we get to even that, I just want to kind of go through how uh, I have seen teams usually break down work. Um, their work breakdown structure usually looks something like this. We have a bunch of features under which there are a bunch of stories. Usually the customer is expecting value in terms of those features and those stories are the steps to that value that teams create. That's the usual breakdown structure that I have seen um, teams use. My guess is your teams have something similar. It might not be exactly like that, but it might be something similar. That's usually the breakdown structure um, we, we, we look at. Now, customers are usually expecting value in that, at that feature level. So the question that they really want to know or the question that teams really want to answer is, how many features can we deliver by a particular date? Um, or, or when will X number of features be done? When can I tell my customer that you're going to get this particular feature? That's usually the, the question the teams are answering. Um, that work breakdown structure is actually surprisingly similar to what I like to call the whiskey breakdown structure. Just like you have multiple stories that make up um, a, uh, 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 a feature, you have multiple drinks that make up a bottle. So essentially the question of how many features we can deliver by date X is very, very similar in my opinion to the question of how many balls of whiskey will be consumed by date X. Those two, in my opinion, happen to be very similar questions. Um, but in order to like, answer those questions, what data do we need? How can we go about answering that question? Um, in my opinion, at least the way I like to answer that question, you need two pieces of data. Uh, first piece of data that you're gonna need is an idea of the number of drinks that will be consumed, similar to the number of stories that can be done. And the second piece of data that we're gonna need is the approximate number of drinks per bottle of whiskey. With those two pieces of data, we should be able to figure out how many bottles of whiskey can we go through. Um, quick audience question. What's the difference between whiskey and whiskey? Any, you can, you can, you can. Scotch or Irish? Your the letter E. Yeah, the E. Yeah, the E. Also, <laughs> so uh, absolutely. The, 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 it's, 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 I think someone mentioned Irish versus Scottish. Um, uh, the, the real, the real difference between whiskey and whiskey is, is exactly that is the country of origin. Um, the rule of thumb, if the, if the name of the country has an E in it, most likely the whiskey from there will have an E in it. Just, the, just, just a general rule of thumb. So for example, American whiskey has an E in it. Meanwhile, Scottish whiskey does not have an E in it. Irish whiskey has an E in it. So just uh yeah, Canadian whiskey. That 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 is a different problem. Someone mentioned Canadian whiskey. That that we will talk about Canadian whiskey right at the end. So that's a real Canadian whiskey is a real problem. All right, so let's go. Let's go about gathering this first data element that we were looking at, which is um, which is number of drinks to be consumed. Um, usually, when someone asks, "Hey, wh what are different ways we can figure out how much of something we can get done, or how many drinks will be consumed?" We go about figuring that out in a few different ways. Um, first is an estimate. We can go and estimate the number of things we can get done or the number of drinks um, I can drink. Or 
go to an expert and say, hey, this is how, this is the problem I have. What do you think the answer will be? Or the my preferred way of answering the question, which is let's actually look at historical data. Let's see how we have done in the past and use that to figure out how we'll do in the future. So in the quest to find out how many drinks of whiskey I'm going to consume in the next four months, that is exactly what we will do. We will try to use our past data to figure out for the next four months or to make it a little simpler, 16 weeks, how many drinks of whiskey will I consume? In order to do that, let's say I provide you over the past 20 weeks, how many drinks of whiskey have consumed. Uh, I, I, I want to say this is weekly data. It might be daily, but I want to say it's weekly data. Um, let's say this is data for how many drinks of whiskey I've had in the past 20 weeks. If I gave you this data, how would you go about answering the question of how many drinks of whiskey will I consume in the next 16 weeks? Average, if some, some, someone mentioned I can, you could take an average of this and, 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 and move forward with it. In fact, that's, since that's the first answer I saw, let's go with that one. Um, on average, there, based on this year, there are 2.3 uh, drinks of whiskey per week. Number of weeks, upcoming weeks I want to forecast is 16. So 2.3 times 16, 36.8. So it looks like about 37 um, drinks of whiskey. I, I see already people talking about simulations and Monte Carlo in the chat. So we will get there. Uh, but before there, let's before we get there, let's try to let's try to find out why average is not such a great answer. Um, the, I'm, I'm hoping a bunch of you have heard of the flaw of averages. If you haven't, Dr. Sam Savage's book, Flaw of Averages, great read. Uh, do 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 read it. It's a collection of essays and. Um, the, the summary of the book is that plans based on average fail on average. You've been wrong with an average half the time in the past, you will be wrong on average half the time in the future. Um, a single number is just one of many outcomes. I'm gonna hit a little more on that in a bit here. Uh, and any prediction that we make should have a range and a probability, especially when we're talking about the future where there are multiple possibilities we should be making our predictions in the form of a range and a probability. The easiest way when someone gives you a single number answer is to ask them the question of how confident are you in that answer? That will start making them, make them, thinking, uh, making them think in the, in the direction of probabilities and percentiles and all that fun stuff. Um, a slight detour that I wanna take here just to hit the, the, the average point a little harder is to talk a little bit about uh, COVID-19 contract tracing, tra tracing that, that, um, that, that we had, we'd all tried to do. And uh, so many of you might be, might be familiar with this story. Um, it, between o September 25th and, and 2nd of October, there were about almost 16,000 cases that went unreported. Even though we had reports for it, they went, uh, they went missing. Um, and when, and that, of course, had had ramifications for the down because this was this was being this data was being used for contact tracing, um, and they were miss they went missing due to IT error. That's that's that that was what we were told. They were missing due to IT error. Uh, um, does anyone know what 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 that IT error was? Anyone have any idea? No. Was right. it somebody typing in from a spreadsheet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I see someone people mentioning Excel. Exactly. That the problem was that we used X that that they were using XLS instead of XLS X, and the old style Microsoft Excel um, had a had a row limit of sixty four thousand. So anything beyond that was just get just went missing, um, and and because that went missing. It's estimated, two economists actually did a study on this and estimated that we probably had uh, 125,000 additional cases and, and, and unfortunately about 1,500 uh, additional COVID related deaths. The reason I bring that up is because the, the, prob the base problem here was they were using the wrong tool. 
they were using XLS instead of XLSX. And you, this, in this case, the, the results were, and, and the, the ramifications were much, much more dire. But for, there's something we can learn from that, which is when the future has multiple, multiple probability, a tool that generates a single point answer is the wrong tool. Using the wrong tool will lead us down the wrong path. Um, and this is where, as someone, someone suggested earlier in the chat, this is where Monte Carlo comes in or a tool that actually generates multiple answers and related probabilities. So remember that uh, my drink consumption for 20 weeks, I actually have the drink consumption for the past 36 weeks. Again, I maintain this is weeks and not days. Uh, I, I, I will maintain that for now uh, till, till, we, till, till you all actually see my drinking habits and tell me that that's not. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, uh, th this is my past 36 weeks and this, we'll, we'll do a quick uh, rudimentary Monte Carlo simulation here with, with using this data. In fact, we're, what we're gonna do is lay this out on this uh, six by six spreadsheet, or six by six grid. Um, and what we could, if we were in person, I would have handed out dice right now for, for everyone. Everyone gets two dice and they get to roll them, but I am going to virtually roll dice for you. I'm gonna roll two dice, assign one to the X axis and the other to the Y axis. Um, so let's say I roll two dice and it came, came up with two and five. So I'll go to row number two and column number five and I land on that three. I'm going to note that down. Remember, this is a six by six grid of what happened in the last 36 weeks. I'm gonna note that down as how many drinks I'm gonna have in the next week, in the upcoming week. Let's do the same thing again. Uh, let's say we roll dice again. We come up with four and three, <clears throat> same, same routine. Row number four, column number three, I land on that two that would be my simulation result for the next, uh, for, the, for the following week, for two, two, two weeks from now. If we did this over and over again, and this is exactly where if we were in person, I would have handed you the sheet and, and feel free, if you have dice at home, take a screenshot of this and, and do this for yourself. If we, if, we were, if we were in person, I would have handed you dice and said, let's do this. Let's take two dice, one to the vertical, one to the horizontal axis and roll it six roll them 16 times to get um to get these 16 results and total them up and if we do that we should get one run of six of simulations that will tell me how many drinks i would consume in the next 16 weeks in the next four months and i'm gonna sh let's let's do that simulation real quick uh, let's say we do we did the same thing we rolled it we got uh, let's say a one and a three ended up at that uh, at that three, um, I'll note that down as my sim for week one, the result is three. Second one, let's say I ended up at that one. I'm gonna note that down. Uh, the second one, the second week simulation gave me a one. Next time I ended up at a zero. I do not believe that will actually happen, but let's say if it's happened in the past, it's probably gonna happen in the future. So that gives me a zero. And if I do that 16 times, I'll get all these different random numbers to get me to a total of 34. Um, let's do this one more time. That is just one single Monte Carlo simulation. What we just did was a single Monte Carlo simulation to figure out how many drinks of whiskey I'll have in the next 16 weeks. Um, if we did that again, um, we could do the exact same thing. Let's say the first one lands on zero, I get the zero. Second one lands on this four, I get the four. And the third one lands on that zero, I get a zero. Um, what do you think? If I run this through, will I get that same 34 again? Yeah, no, probably most likely not. We are randomly selecting from the past. Yeah, if we run this through, I got a 40. If we did this over and over again, as you would see, as you can see, we will get multiple different results. Um, in fact, we will get different results, different number of times. Um, I did this about a thousand times. I used Excel to do it um, as much as I have bashed Excel already. I did use Excel. I used the XLSX format 
not just the XLS format. Um, and I plotted the results on a histogram to say how many times did each result show up. So on, on the bottom axis here, this is how many times that, uh, wh what was the number that showed up? And up, up the Y axis here is how many times did that result show up? So for example, the result of 37 showed up 72 times. The result of 45 showed up 26 times. The results of 52 showed up twice. Result of 24 showed up twice as well. Now that we have this result, what we can do, and this is where we go back to our probabilistic thinking, um, is we can see, we can look at this in a more probabilistic manner with a, with those, with, with a most, more percentile approach to say that 95% of the results are 30 or greater, which means I have a 95% chance that I will drink at least 30 drinks of whiskey over the next 16 weeks, 30 or more, at least 30. Similarly, 70% uh, is at 35, which means 70% chance it'll be 35 or more. This is purely based on the past um, on the past data again, and 50% is 38 or more. And there's a 10% chance of it being 44 or more. So we have a decent idea along with probability, again, range and probability, the probability being, for example, 70% and the range being 35 or more. We have a range and probability answer to that question based on our past data. Um, one interesting thing I always like to mention here is our most likely result was 38. That's very close to that average, 37, but it only came up 81 times in these thousand simulations. So even though that's the most likely result, it's only 8% likely, 8.1% likely. So that's, that's just an interesting result that even the most likely is not very likely. And that's why we need this range and probability approach. So we have, uh, we have gotten the first piece of data that I needed to find out um, how many balls of whiskey I can get, uh, I, can, I will go through. Uh, the second piece of data that we need is the approximate number of drinks per bottle. The next step in answering how many is getting an idea of size. So now we know if that, uh, if that past data was correct, our future looks like we have a decent idea how many drinks of whiskey we would have. Now the question is, how many drinks go in a bottle? So quick whiskey fact, uh, a bottle of whiskey contains about 12 two ounce drinks and most whiskey drinks are made with either one, one and a half or two ounces. Uh, someone's asking me about bottle whip. That is a talk for another day. Uh, the, how, what the bottle whip, that is a talk for another day. That is a very, bottle whip has very interesting consequences. But we'll talk about that another day. Um, so. In general, that is our, our um, size or number of drinks per bottle. Um, so similarly, we, need, we should be able to figure out what our feature size is as well. We just talked about how many drinks in a bottle. Now, how many stories in a feature? Um, once again, when we ask that question, our mind usually goes to a single number answer to a single uh, to, to, to that, that age old um, uh, method of using averages. So again, want to remind you of the flaw of averages, plans based on average, fail on average. Uh, the way I at least coach teams to, to look at this is to use something called a scatter plot, not a cycle time scatter plot, but this is actually a feature size scatter plot. Um, I have, uh, I have repurposed actionable agile uh, for, for this, but you can you do this again in Excel, whichever format you choose to use, XLS or XLSX, it will work in both. Um, what I have done here is along, along the Y axis there is the number of stories in a, in a feature uh, and along the X axis is date that when that uh, feature was completed, which means the, and each dot here is a feature, which means that for every feature that completes, I have an idea of how many stories that feature was made up on. 
So I have a decent idea what the size of each feature was. Now I can do something very similar to what uh, those of you familiar with cycle time scatter plots do with your with your um, with, with figuring out what your cycle time SLE should be, which is look at this and go. 85% of my features had 17 stories or less. So I have a decent idea of what my feature size is. Uh, not, not using an average, because again, outliers influence averages a lot, but 85% of our features we know are 17 stories or less. Back to whiskey, because we can't ever stray too far away from whiskey. Again, those were the facts we had. Um, I am going to, uh, just as I did with, uh, with, uh, with the feature size in terms of stories, use the more conservative two ounce um, uh, two, two ounce pour uh, and say, I'm gonna, I can get 12 drinks out of a bottle of whiskey. Which using that, if I want to answer how many bottles of whiskey can I finish? My, if you remember our 95% Monte Carlo re result was 30, 30 drinks. So 30 divided by 12 is about two and a half. 70% was 35, which is about three bottles. And 50% is 38, so about 3.2 bottles. So at different levels of confidence, I can say that over the next four, uh, four months, I can get through, if 95%, I'll get through two and a half or more bottles. 70%, I'll get to three or more bottles. 50%, I'll get 3.2 or more bottles. So now we can apply probably the exact same method to figuring out uh, what our, our capacity plan would look like as well. If this was not um, the drinks consumed, instead was the number of stories a team completed um, in the past, past, uh, past days or weeks, past 36 days, let's say, we could do the exact same thing that we just did and uh, come up with that answer. In fact, that's usually what I ask teams to do, what we ask teams to do, go to Actionable Agile. Again, talk to Julia Wester about Actionable Agile, go to, go to the 55 degrees booth so she can, she can answer more questions about it. Um, and they go run Monte Carlo and find out, oh, I can do 157 items in the next 90 days. At that point, it's it, capacity planning for them is a five minute, is essentially a five minute exercise. They go, I can do 157 items. My feature size, if you remember that chart I showed earlier was 17 stories or less, 85% of the time, which means 17 stories or less, 157 items with an 85% confidence, 57 divided by 17 is about nine which means this team has a, nine, has a capacity of finishing nine right size features, which again, we're not getting into right sizing today, uh, in the next 90 days. Literally, they have come up with their uh, capacity plan in five minutes. This is how many features we can do. This is how many things we can commit to a customer. Now, again, there is a lot more to it, but in general, this is where they start. The the point that really what I'm trying to, to get our teams to do is not to play Tetris with their releases and fit it exactly. This is, this is how big this feature is. This is how big this feature is. I have 157, I'm gonna fit it precisely. Instead, we're thinking about this more as how many of these similar size or, or right size pebbles I can finish in a jar. This way, when things change, they still have room to do other things. We're not trying to play Tetris with our releases. We don't need to fit things perfectly. We need to, things change, so we need to leave room for that change. In fact, the things change is exactly uh, where this concept of continuous planning comes in. We've only done capacity planning so far. We've done a single point, one-time forecast. Um, just a one-time forecast, you know, we're done all the stuff, what could go wrong? Um, obviously, for those of you who have either read or seen The Shining, know that a lot of things can go wrong. Um, a lot of our inspiration comes from, I am in South Florida, which means I get a lot of hurricanes. Uh, so our inspiration for all of this comes from hurricanes. When the National Hurricane Center here puts out a forecast, they don't just put out the forecast and leave. They, every time they get new information, they reforecast. This is a matter of life and death. 
They put out a forecast. Every time they get new information, they put out another forecast. Similarly, our teams should do the same thing. That initial forecast is not enough. Every time we get new information, we need to reforecast and tell folks what's going, what's actually going on under the surface. As more, more data becomes available, we need to reassess our plans and, and, and know that our, day, our, our forecasts are only as valid as, uh, un, un, unless the underlying data hasn't changed. Uh, let's skip through the slide real quick. Commonly, uh, things change. I mean, you all have probably seen this happen every day with your teams. teams. Teams speed up, slow down. Someone mentioned if Dan comes by to visit, this will change, create crazy visibility in the whiskey consumption. Yes. Similar, it's a whiskey consumption can go up or slow down. Um, new, new requests can come in. Deadlines can change. As all those things happen, we need to reforecast. In fact, teams I work with, we have a board that's up like this, which reforecasts every half an hour. Every half an hour, we go out there, see if the due date for something has changed. Each row on this board, by the way, is a feature, is a feature that the team's working towards. The stories, how, how many stories are remaining. And then every half an hour, we run Monte Carlo to come up with their chance to finish. What is the probability that that feature is going to get done? So every half an hour, we're going out there, gathering all this data and rerunning our forecasts. In summary, um, really, the, the, we, we're all very familiar with forecasting at the story level, but when customers expect value at the feature level, we need to figure out how to convert that forecast into feature. And that's, that's kind of one example of what I, what I showed you, which is how do we convert that forecast into a feature level forecast? Um, we want to think more in terms of those jar of pebbles and not Tetris. We do not need to fit everything in perfectly. Uh, hashtag no Tetris. And uh, again, update our forecasts uh, 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 and reforecast as often as possible. And as I mentioned earlier, do not drink Canadian whiskey. We talked about, I said, I'll come back to Canadian whiskey. I came back to Canadian whiskey. Do not drink. There is no reason to drink it. There are so many better options. Don't drink Canadian whiskey.